The 1924 expedition to summit Mount Everest was crude. It was a ragtag band of English survivalists guided by Sherpas who were more often than not treated as disposable. They were at their wits end and on their second expedition in two years. That kind of pressure can change a man's psyche. A man's psyche can emanate something into the unknown. An event that's significant can have ripples through mediums we haven't even begun to understand. Man has always conquered extremes, but the highest point on earth is by definition an ultimate extreme. It is the tip of something more than us. Over 4,000 people have made their pilgrimage to the peak of our little world now. Everest no more than an expensive vacation for 20-somethings with trust funds and adrenaline addictions, but it used to mean something. The first true summit attempt was different, and it wasn't because it was the last time George Mallory and Sandy Irvin were seen alive. Something else happened that day on the mountain that is still unexplained. It was their third attempt during this expedition that something happened on the mountainside. It was as if God himself cursed humanity for our hubris. Mallory and Irvin were seen close to the summit, and the clouds rolled in. They were never seen alive again. The event was biblical. At times, reality can be stranger than fiction. It's hard to write a story that compelling, hard to outdo reality in its endless capacity for chaos. Sometimes the chaos aligns and you can practically see the fractal ticking clock of the universe at work. It's a mystery so tantalizing that to this day it casts a tiny, lingering doubt on the 1953 official first summit of the mountain. It is believed that Irvine and Mallory did not make it to the top of the mountain by many, but this tiny sliver of doubt, this possibility of history being rewritten, remains trapped on the mountain like a flashing episodic memory burned into the rock face. Something sinister sits at the rotten core of that mountain. Reality is stranger than fiction. I know it because I have stared into the reality of what really happened on that fateful day in 1924. I've seen the photographs they took in their final moments. When Mallory and Irvin went up the summit, they took a camera with them to take a photo of man's great achievement. It hasn't officially been found. That is, the public and climbing community know it to be missing still. I'm here to tell you that this obfuscation of the truth is completely and entirely purposeful and is orchestrated by powers you could never imagine. It is exactly what they want you to believe. I developed the film myself. I've gazed into the abyss and the abyss has filled me up past the brim. I carry the burden of what was captured on that rudimentary technology. I don't have long left. That's the only reason I'm laying this burden down. I'm not old, but sick beyond my years. Maybe releasing this ballast will let me finally rest in peace, knowing that someone else will believe the truth about what happened up there. What became of Irvine? For his sake, I hope he was killed instantly. I think that's what bothers me the most, is never really knowing what happened to him. He could even still be out there somewhere, in a different form that we can't even perceive. I'm getting ahead of myself. Every scrap of information about that day has my head spinning. The Kodak organization of course is known best for photographic film, cameras, and development procedures. As a budding chemical engineer in my field it was difficult to imagine that my life have dwindled to the shriveled speck it is now. I had so much career hope, so much optimism. Now I find it hard to get out of bed in the morning. My piece in this puzzle has been set faded from the start, and my part in this picture is long over. I was killed off in the first act, and I'm just waiting silently in the wings for it to be all over. This silence must be broken. Kodak became very comfortable with the government over a long period of time. When the United States began nuclear tests in the Nevada desert, all our x-ray paper was splatter painted with high energy particles. We never got hush money like that again. We were in cahoots whether we liked it or not. We knew and we didn't squeal. The kids and I had a great vacation that year. Analog photography and the United States were just chummy. They scratched our backs in return for our silence. Men in suits and badges always coming in and out without warning. They never took a damn thing. They just asked us some vague questions and made wretched forced smiles lingering in our labs and warehouses. They knew something we didn't and we had to sit there and take it. 
you could hardly look over your shoulder without someone hovering, taking little notes, and speaking sweet nothings into each other's ears. Get a room. Any questions we asked got polite smiles and condescending chuckles in return, like we were school children asking where babies came from. It was clear they had a plan for us. They were developing us, making us comfortable with their presence, waiting for the right time for us to bend knee and accept orders. That time came in the mid-2000s when we learned about that fateful roll of film. One day they burst through the door of the lab, and from down the hallway, I could see a cart being pushed through film stock inventory into the development lab. It was a long hallway, and that one free spinning caster wheel squeaked multitudes past shelves of equipment and undeveloped rolls of memories. It was surrounded by armed militants. This time they were armed. Something bigger than all of us fit into that little steel box. It seemed to be a heavily modified safe, a little one you'd see under the counter at a gas station. It had some kind of climate control system attached, something that didn't need external power. It let off hints of Freon and old book smell. Two large men pushed the cart into our lab, and a man I would grow to resent appeared before me for the first time, followed by several lackeys. He wore a slim fit suit. It was too slim for his figure. The stress of his position was carried on his alcoholic gut and protruding love handles. The bags under his eyes and thinning head of blonde hair spoke volumes to what the man was carrying in his head. They had broken him in. I don't think he would fit in bagging groceries or slicing deli cuts anymore. He wasn't fit for society. He was one of them, and they had put out the light in his eyes. He had that type of paranoid exhaustion you get from always looking over your shoulder like any moment could be your last. He was as kind as he could be given what he had seen. God knows my involvement in all this took its toll. This was just another day at the office for him. His name was Jerome Newton, and I don't fully blame him for my ruination. He was just following orders. Look at me. I've got Stockholm Syndrome. I've always been a fucking pushover. We shared an amicable handshake and some polite conversation, but the distracting nature of the 100-pound elephant in the room and its security detail quickly became the subject of the conversation. It had been found. Irvine's camera had been found, decades ago in fact. They had been waiting for the right moment to see just what was on it, and they chose our lab to do it. They never told us how they recovered it from the mountain, or where it was, and at that time I was given no information on Irvine's body. In hindsight, it all checks out. They knew our curiosity as men of science would override any resistance we had. We had a feeling we couldn't say no, and no one ever did. My biggest regret is not being able to explain what happened to my boys, and my wife. In their minds I went to work and never came back. I wish I could see you all one last time. My involvement in this operation erased me from the public record without my permission. I became a ghost. As far as the good old USA was concerned, I had gone missing. Of course we resisted and things came to a head. But human beings fear what we don't understand. We never understood what they were capable of doing to us. They made it clear that unspeakable things awaited us if our new accommodations were unsatisfactory. We worked on site at our discreet location. Kodak had several manufacturing sites away from the public eye, and our development lab was chosen as the most unassuming. They provided our every need, food, water, shelter, but information was on a need-to-know basis. We got to work ensuring the film was preserved to the, the utmost levels of care. It was old film and was on the mountain with blinding snow and the elements for decades. For all we knew it would turn up blank, but we wouldn't know until we started developing. We spent two weeks discussing every possible scenario in which this film could be safely transported to our proper station and developed. Every single precaution was painstakingly detailed. The floors of the lab were coated in a rubberized substrate to prevent accidental slips. We were given daily sterilized uniforms and trained on containment breach protocols. They were incinerated after every day of work. The room was swept of every speck of dust. Air filtration systems were installed. It may have been the cleanest clean room on earth for that two week period. Any tool, any machine, any chemical at the world's disposal was sent by same day air if it was even suggested to be used. It was a miracle to witness. For every unethical act the United States performed, they performed 10 logistical acts of God. 
When the day came, when we finally breached the camera's containment unit, it was funny how small the damn thing was. To think how much money was spent on this little chintzy thing made us all chuckle by the time the safe door swung open. The camera was painstakingly disassembled in the dark room. It was incredible how fast we got used to men with weapons at the ready. We felt like prisoners, but damn did it feel good to be finally doing my work again. It was an oasis in the vast loneliness of that same damn room. The photos were developed with the highest purity of materials available. Who knows where they got the stuff from? It was obvious they knew as much about photography as any of us or more. Jerome and I got a look at the first image. As the image came through, we saw a blank white rectangle fade into existence. It was a dud. Jerome slammed his fist on the table, startling everyone. It had been exposed to sunlight at some time between taking the photo and it sitting on the mountain. We all just sat there in silence for what felt like hours. Then something else started coming through. As if God breathing life into Adam, a few little black smudges faded into the developed image. We shook our heads and watched as this Rorschach of negative space became more and more detailed. We started piecing together what it was. It looked to be column of light so bright that the camera's primitive lenses became almost completely blown out. Whatever was generating this beam seemed to be firing up from the ground at the exact summit point of the mountain. It was almost like an energy field, something you would see on an episode of Star Trek. It was such a strange feeling sitting in silence, holding our breaths. We simultaneously knew that they had done it, that Irvine and Mallory had summited first. But from what we could tell, the instant it occurred and the same instant the photo was taken, a light source stronger than the sun had overtaken their camera, but there was a shadow of something halfway in the beam, an indiscernible smudge at the threshold. We spent 30 minutes discussing what was happening, while the other images slowly appeared. Our attention was turned to the next string of images as our jaws dropped in horror, our eyes all widened at the same time. The second image after the beam was the two top knuckles of a pointer and middle finger and entire thumb laying like a charcuterie on the fresh snow. The thumb was still draped in a piece of glove that seemed to have come off with it. There was no pool of blood to be seen in contrast against the white snow. It was as if they had been burned off and fallen to the ground like an oak shedding its autumn leaves. The image was so clinical, as if the person with the camera was completely still. There was no sense of haste or drama, no shake, no blur. It was like crime scene documentation. The very tips of the fingernails were blue. Whoever's hand this was had the first symptoms of frostbite. A sense of cascading dread filled the room. None of us spoke a word. We made pale eye contact and cleared our throats as the next images became crisp through the fog. It would only get worse from here. The next image seemed to be the same patch of snow, except the flesh had been utterly removed. Only thin sinews remained on white bone. The severed ends appeared perfectly flat. Whatever had cut through them seems to have done so instantly, and with extreme precision. I began feeling lightheaded, and in turn wretched and spilled his guts on the floor. It was as if the bits of hand were perfectly stripped of their flesh, and had been placed back in exactly the same position they were in before. Jerome began barking to the few military men left around us to leave through the light locked double doorway. They did so immediately and waited outside. It was just him and I, and the squeamish intern left inside the dark room. Jerome took off his ill-fitting suit coat and draped it on a lab chair. He sat down and put his hand to his forehead, his left knee shaking, his fingers anxiously massaging his wrinkled brow. We stared at him like obedient dogs waiting for food. He was running this operation and he was at a loss thus far. When I looked back at the first image of the beam of light, I gasped. The image was now fully realized. It was undeniable. What I saw was that inside the column of light was the thin, ghostly shadow of a skeleton in a wretched position of sheer agony, his hand barely outside the threshold of the column. It was the same fingers in the later photos. We realized whose ever fingers it was, this was the final trace of their body. Somehow their hand escaped the power of the column and dropped to the ground, as if the energy field had appeared and vanished in an instant, taking their doomed body with it. We soon knew it was Irving who had been caught in this anomaly, I will now tell you how we knew. The last photo on the roll of film is burned into my primal ape brain forever, I'll never unsee it. 
It was Mallory. He was kneeling, one leg in the snow, over top of the severed fingers. The photo was taken from about 15 feet away. At this point in the film reel, something had happened to Irvin beyond our most terrible imaginations. As far as we knew, he had vanished. We had no idea who was taking the photos now. He was holding onto the thumb between both hands, as if he was holding a chicken leg, and he was smiling. His oxygen tank was nowhere to be seen. They were well above the death zone of Everest. The air is so thin up there your body is dying slowly every second without supplemental oxygen. His eyes were bold and bright, far from the tired eyes expected of a man weeks into an expedition. His teeth were stained with what we could only discern to be blood. Half of the fingers were deboned already. His shirt was removed beside him in the snow. The next image was Mallory having finished the rest of the fingers. The next image was Mallory from the same angle biting off his own middle finger, his pointer already decapitated at the second knuckle. The final photo was Mallory smiling from ear to ear, his now frostbitten face taking up nearly the entire frame. His eyes were utterly cloudly in their pupils, like someone with advanced cataracts. The rest of the images were blank. The three of us just stared at these images. We couldn't seem to piece together the timeline of events. The photos had to have been taken in order, but elements across each image seemed to defy time. They had been rearranged somehow. We spoke at length about how impossible this was, but there it was staring us in the face. It didn't matter what order we put the images in, they never painted a congruous timeline of events. The same anomaly that took Irving, or what was left of his body away had left clues of itself behind on this film. As we laid down that night in our army cots in the break room of the facility, I think we all tried to keep our eyes open for as long as we could, in hopes of staving off the nightmares we were prepared for. It started to sink in that our lives would never be the same. When we woke up in the morning, the guards were gone, and the dark room was empty, completely empty. All of our equipment was gone. Jerome was there. He explained that our lives as we knew them were over. I never went home. I won't go into the details of my personal life here because my life is essentially over now. I have inoperable pancreatic cancer. Our intern caught the same type four years ago. He passed on. Something tells me that wasn't a coincidence. I think they wanted to get rid of us sooner to put us out of our misery, and I think he rolled over and accepted it. God, I'm so fucking paranoid. Too much time to think about all of this. Seeing them follow me has been the worst part. But guess what? I know exactly when they're driving past my place, and I can tell exactly which of them are the gang stalkers and which are just my neighbors. It's all in the eyes. I don't have time to explain now, but the milky white eyes flick on for a moment. It's in reference to the last image. They know why they're trying to make me feel this way, like I can't leave, like I should just stay indoors like a good little pet. Well, I've had enough but I've accepted enough orders in my life. With the few years I have left alone on this earth after the relocation and reprogramming to ensure I never go back to my family, I have nothing left to lose. As I type this now I'm on a flight to Nepal. If I can get out of the country and through airport security, I think I have a shot. If they want to stop me, they're going to have to climb after me. I'll be sending this out as my last message. While my health is still good, I'm going up there once and for all, even if it kills me. I know those bones are up there, some kind of residue, a burn mark in the rock. There has to be something. There has to be a trace of him left. I think his fingers are still up there. They have to be up there. They just have to be up there. I have to do this. They made me this way. I used to think my part in this was over, but now I think I am at the utmost center of this all. I think this was my destiny. I can save all of this. I have one chance to see for myself some trace of what happened up there all those years ago. Whatever higher power did this, I want to be there when it happens again. I think it chose me next. They know I'm coming for them. They have to know. Whatever it is, whoever they are, I'm coming to see for myself what's happening up there. I know there's proof up there. There has to be proof up there, otherwise it was all for nothing. It wasn't for nothing. It means something. 